I have dedicated my professional career to the study and control of arthropods. Good morning. So today I'm going to talk about uh, intersexual selection. Um, but before I start, you know, I looking outside today, it's one of those rare, beautiful, sunny days here in Juneau. Um, and days like this always take me way back to my childhood and, you know, the long, long summer hours spent just pretending. I'm scared, Sydney. I don't want to do it. I want to see my parents. Finish the simulation, Lithoted Man, and I'll see what I can do. Oh, anyway, um... So back to uh, intersexual selection. Um, I'm gonna uh, kind of do some discuss kind of the, the, this concept a little bit, and then I'll get into some examples. This is probably going to be several parts. Okay. So um, intersexual selection. This is the the battle between the sexes, is what we call it in our society. Um, you know, that's it, a social construct, but biologically, there really is a battle between the sexes. Um, even even no matter what you see, the you know the lovebirds whatever they're at war with each other in in a biological sense and um, so I want to kind of get get some get some ideas across here uh, first of all a lot of people don't understand why the sexes would be battling in nature um, you know common goal they have offspring that they both want to have children they both want to put individuals into the next generation in evolutionary biology we talk about the winning strategy um, is the individual that puts the most offspring into the next generation, right? Um, and with sexually reproducing species, one of the things you have to think about, this is where the sort of the war begins, um, is that for a species, an asexual species, a cloning species, they put every one of their offspring has 100% of their genome. Does that make sense? You're copying. It's, you're just making a photocopy of yourself, and there's my baby. Looks just like me, right? Um, there's copy errors and things like that, but I'm talking about overall, a sexually reproducing species, the best that they can hope for is 50% of their genome into the next generation, right? Into each individual offspring can have 50%. If they have two offspring, however, they can potentially have all of their um, genetic potential into the next generation, but it's in two individuals. Likewise, every copy is, is one more percentage higher. Um, that's what we call reproductive success. That's how you, that's how you, it's fitness. It's a measure of fitness. It's a measure of, of your, um, your reproductive, anyway, reproductive success, I guess, is a better term than fitness in that. I'm, I apologize. So um, what we get then with sexually reproducing species is you get this, since you are automatically, with each offspring, losing 50% of your genetic potential into the next generation, choosing that mate carefully suddenly might become some might be something important if you think about it right um do you want does as a female do you want to mate with the male who has 90 percent of his offspring do you know drop dead after they hatch out of the egg is that is that the individual you want to mate with sorry i had a phone call there um so this um that example of the male who produces has a 90% mortality rate of his offspring is a really good example and actually leads right into my next the next step or next explanation um so you, as you probably are aware um in in at least some taxa specifically uh mammals birds um although it applies really applies across the animal kingdom or plant kingdom fungi whatever you know all of those it, it it's it's prevalent is you find that um, the actual cost of reproduction for a male is very often different than the reproductive cost for the female. All right, um, this this it, it, this actually works on many different levels, um, but on a really basic, on a, what they call a gametic level, right? The actual gam gamete production, sperm is cheap. An individual sperm cell contains very very little energy um, it doesn't take a lot to produce um, during uh, meiosis every single every every a, a male can produce four sperm at a time through meiosis um, 
these kinds of the, in, in mammals. So we got that, and that so it's it's a fast process. It's an easy process. Sperm's easily replaced. It's it's easily wasted. It doesn't cost much to waste it, um, as some of us know really well. Um, females, on the other hand, egg production is costly. Eggs tend to be very very large cells. They very often contain yolk nutrients. Um, they have lots and lots of mitochondria. They have lots of things to sustain them. Eggs tend to live very, very long. Sperm are quick, very ephemeral. Um, so right there from the production of gametes, the female's investment is already significantly larger um, than in males. And in actual production, um, a female produces one egg cell at a time during during meiosis. Um, and if you probably I don't know if you're aware, males, one, one uh, single, one cell can be converted to four sperm cells, while in females, one cell makes one egg cell. It makes three byproducts that die, but it's because of that, that nutrient cost. Um, so anyway, that's like really uh, an important, something that has to be taken into consideration. And then after that, if you've got a species that's gestates, the offspring's growing inside the female, or the eggs are developing inside the female to a certain point. Um, you've got the fertilization process. You've got the female is taking gametic products into her body um, she's got the uh, afterwards raising offspring oftentimes uh, at the very least brooding the offspring to hatching if not taking care of them after that fact and um, this is often with or, with or without male's help but the point is that overall there's a tendency for females to invest more energy into each individual offspring than males do Males tend to not invest, obviously, not as much, um, and that's that's that changes a lot when you get to social animals, and changes more when you get to pair bonded monogamous animals and these kinds of things. So these issues, um, that it, it it changes the equation slightly, but the rules still apply. Uh, sorry, keep track of time here. I'm going to make again make this in several parts because this is really critically important. So back to my example. Here's a male who. Every time, every single time, he he mates. He has ten offspring. Nine of them die. One of them uh, overall survives. Okay, that's just the way. Some genetic defect. That's the way it is. They hatch out of the egg and they fall over dead for the most part. Is that a huge cost to him? Okay, let's pick a species where there's no male care whatsoever. The male just flies around and mates with females as he encounters them. Okay. He can mate with 10 more females, right? Suddenly he's, you know, there you go. There's his 10 offspring for that year. He's got them. Female, on the other hand, female of this species, right? She wants 10 offspring this year. What can she do? Should she mate with this male? Can she produce 10 clutches of eggs so that she'll get 10 offspring that survive? What's the cost on her body and her time and her and her energy and her everything just simply you know is it even possible or is she going to want to choose a better male she's going to want to choose a male that has a better success rate of offspring so that gets down to the question of how does she know you know we talked about you know the uh, Wallacean fitness the tail of the peacock means good genes so if, if this male's got a big tail hey he must be one of those does that tell you about the mortality of his offspring? What does that tell you? Does, this, does that contain truth in advertising? Um, and how does the female know? Obviously, uh, females can't genotype potential mates in the, in the animal kingdom. Humans can now. We can actually genotype our, our mating partners. Uh, most of the animal kingdom doesn't have that option. So how does a female know? So this is when we get into a really, really... Some, cool examples. I'm going to stop this now and go to part two.